Welcome back, everybody, to the final cast talk of the day. Time has flown, and I'm joined by the very able Vicky Shaik. Vicky, welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, right, today, uh, or right now, we're going to dive into the, uh, the three previous uh, uh, anchoring events that we've had on water, cities, and finance. And we have a, a last-minute special fourth segment um, in which we'll reveal the winner of a climate adaptation uh, competition that was organized by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, in this session, uh, I did actually notice that all of our guests are, are men, but seeing as how the previous session was an almost entirely female one, then I guess we can let that slide. What yeah. do you think, Vicky? And I'm uh, here. Okay. I'm a female. Yes, this is true. <laughs> this is true. Okay. Um, uh, before we start, though, another quick reminder. It's the last session of the day, but uh, you've been pretty good in terms of uh, giving us feedback and asking questions, um, at least on, on Twitter. So keep doing that. Use the hashtag Adaptation Summit. And if you'd like to ask a question to one of our guests, you can also use the chat function on the CAS platform. All right. Yeah. So what's first, Vicky? Um, well, our first topic is water, uh, the anchoring event on water resilience uh, just finished. So let's see what happens. We know that climate change often expresses itself through water. Nine out of 10 natural disasters are water related. Annual average losses from flooding are over $40 billion water-related climate risks cascade through food, energy, urban, and environmental systems. Countries now have a chance to set themselves on a greener, more resilient, and more equitable development path. Private companies like Danone have commitments to become water impact positive, acting where it matters most, targeting the full landscape beyond the factory gates aiming for water, carbon and biodiversity benefits. We're starting a water adaptation hub, a central place where we bring knowledge, experience, political will, cultures and more together from in and outside the water sector. Remember, communicate, accelerate, scale up with water. Join the community now. The importance of these water landscapes is emphasized more than ever in human history. But upon closer inspection, Delta regions are experiencing some of our most pressing challenges in the light of rapid urbanization and climate change. Friends and colleagues, water is the foundation of all life in our planet and other things, sustainable development and food security. It must be a priority across the climate agenda. I urge all countries to consider this when updating their adaptation communications and national adaptation plans this year. I welcome the message of a global commission that if we can translate national ambition into action across the world, we will not only reduce the impacts of climate, but deliver social and economic benefits and prosperity that will transform the prospects for the world's poorest communities. Another hopeful session there. And the host of the anchoring event on water was also featured in that video, the Minister for uh, Infrastructure and Water Management, uh, Quarter Fund Neuenhausen. Um, and that session was designed to um, convey a sense of urgency as well as show a path forward uh, to uh, water resilience um, and accelerating uh, adaptation. Um, yeah, positive. Yes, and the community of partners will continue their effort uh, beyond the summit. Uh, so the water hub uh, will be available through the data and knowledge platform launched as a part of the adaptation action agenda. Uh, and if you are interested, then reach out to our partners. Exactly. Go and check out that water hub. Okay, the first guest in this session is going to be um, a man who's uh, pretty much responsible of making to uh, responsible for making sure that the Dutch don't get um, wet feet when they don't want to. He is in charge of our Delta program, um, and he is the uh, Dutch Delta program commissioner, Peter Glass. Peter, can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you perfectly. 
Great to be with you. I'm loving the Dutch representation. Your orange tie there, your orange uh, uh, yeah, yeah, pin. Yeah, yeah. I'm all geared up. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, um, uh, perhaps you can just describe uh, um, a little bit your, your role as, uh, as a Delta program um, sure. chief. Sure. Well, being Dutch, living in this country, this Delta, which is happy to host this uh, wonderful event, I've been with you uh, from uh, from early this day. Uh, we've had our share of uh, of water crises over the centuries, maybe a thousand years, as long as we can remember. And every time we uh, we uh, well resilient as we are, we uh, stood up, uh, straightened our backs, and uh, and went forward. And it is in this tradition that we still. Uh, work and uh, it was about 10 years ago the question was asked how can we progress how can we deal with all these issues uh, in the course of this century in the face of sea level rise of droughts of uh, well the necessity was already felt to adapt our cities and and our environment to the changing uh, climate uh, to indeed a, a climate crisis and the uh, and the extreme weather events that's also hitting this country and so the delta program was designed in the netherlands uh, and uh, it is actually in the law now there is a delta program and the obligation of the delta commissioner who is an independent figure um, and i'm the second uh, in that position independent from politics and also independent of the uh, let's say the chain of command in the ministries um, so it's my uh, duty to uh, come up with uh, actually three Delta plans each year and present that to the minister, cabinet, and then to ultimately to parliament. And it involves uh, large sums of money. It's not just talk. It's not just policy making. Uh, it is important to, to think about the principles of how to go forward in an adaptive way. But also put it to practice. So uh, the Dutch, uh, well, they invest about, I would say, two billion euros every year in adaptation, and out of that, uh, 1.3 is in the Delta Fund. Mm -hmm. Also, that is in the law. There is a Delta Fund, which makes a reservation for all these investments uh, for 14 years on end. Um, so, so, and and very consistently within the Delta program. We do not look for just one decade of action, mm. but actually three generations of, of action mm -hmm. towards 2100 and beyond. Yeah. So that's in short uh, 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 my wonderful uh, uh, task that I am uh, happy to uh, perform in, in this uh, little delta, this Fantastic. neck of, the, of, of, of on this planet. And, and you alluded to it a little bit there. I mean, it's, for over a thousand years, the, the Netherlands has been, um, um, it's been built on water. So it's a kind of, uh, an, in, an, in a very unique way, people have been forced to work together. It's almost like this um, uh, idea of collaboration really sits in the DNA of, of the Dutch. Um, what, yes. what do you think? Well, I, I mean, that's... Um we talk about governance in a way. Uh, it's a very abstract term, but governance is the way how you do it. When you know what you want and why, that's the urgency behind it, then you think about how we do it. The institutions, the science, the money, the participation, transparency, all of these elements that are, by the way, also uh, very important in the other part of my work, with the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. They have a water governance initiative, mm -hmm. and that's a global platform. Mm -hmm. We meet twice a year, and then we think this through. What are the principles of good water governance, mm -hmm. and what are indicators for that? And uh, you're, everybody's welcome. Just Google water governance initiative, OECD, and there's, uh, all there's a lot of information. But turning back to the Netherlands, we have indeed a, a unique uh, form of governance where there are independent water authorities or water boards that are older than the state of the Netherlands. They go back to the Middle Ages already. And why, and why is that you so have key? A, a, You've mentioned an area which is practical. Sorry, Sorry you, yeah. you've mentioned it a, a few times now, this, this idea of independence. Why is that so key to, uh, to the success to date in the Netherlands? Um, 
in my capacity, I have the obligation, but it's an honor, to try to connect all levels of government. So that's the national government, provincial, regional, the water boards, and the municipal level. They all have things to do. Mm -hmm. uh, pub, uh, water management in the Netherlands is almost 99% perhaps public. And obviously, uh, 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 the uh, the uh, well, the community of businesses also has a role to play. But a lot of it is is, gov is, is government in the Netherlands, but also connect across these scale, these uh, levels of government, but also the scales, the national scale, the international connection to the hinterland of Europe, but uh, right to the street scale in your own neighbourhood. What can people do there? How can they green their own environment? So connect all these scales, the different aspects um, of, of water connecting also to, well, to nature mm -hmm. conservation, to agriculture, to the greening of energy production. Um, so water is really pivotal. It's a blue thread connecting all these uh, transitions mm -hmm. that we are faced with as, as humanity. Mm. as nations, as people, and um, so, uh, and therefore I think uh, an independent figure like myself, um, it's uh, difficult to talk about yourself, but anyhow, um, that can be uh, an asset um, uh, yeah. uh, to, to try to, to bring this all together and do this every year. Yeah. But you are making it sound very smooth. Come on, tell us, what are the, what's the biggest challenge that you face, though? We're talking about achieving complete water resilience by 2030. Um, uh, yeah, what's, what's the biggest it's obstacle? A, well, the biggest uh, um, challenge is, is to, 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 to keep on top of this. Never let down. Um, to realize that this is, as I said, it's not just about a year of action or going to the next conference or a decade of action. No, it's one, two, three generations because this is the scale, the time scale of this crisis in slow motion, which the climate crisis is and, and therefore uh, also connected to the ad adaptation. That's also an agenda which is much longer. So. To, to keep uh, the track of, of, the, of the science, uh, things that are changing in, in the Antarctic, melting glaciers and ice caps and, uh, and all that, and, 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 and then also uh, keep the pressure on the politics mm -hmm. and on the executive branches of government that they have to, every time they put a spade in the ground, as I always used to, uh, 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 to put it, uh, think about climate adaptation, think about water resilience, and uh, if you put that on the, the agenda in the middle of the table, like where you are, and you start talking about it, you get to better solutions. So, on the one, one hand, maybe I sound a bit, a bit smooth, <laughs> but it is hard work. <laughs> it's sweat uh, on top of inspiration, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, um, well, never let anybody escape from this challenge. Now, fantastic. I'm going to have to put a spade in the ground of our conversation, unfortunately. But thank you very much for all of your, uh, for all of your insights and your, yeah, your positivity. Loved it. Yeah, and uh, we will connect to the hub and uh, all the information on the Delta program in the Netherlands. You can Google that also. It's also there in English for everyone uh, to be inspired. And you are most welcome uh, uh, to connect. Thank you very much, Mr. Glass. My pleasure. Okay, from joint action uh, amongst partners in the Netherlands uh, to, um, to achieve collective goals, um, to regional action in Latin America and the Caribbean area. Um, let's watch a video about the challenges uh, that that region is facing um, and its efforts to adapt. Latin America has been dramatically affected by the pandemic. COVID showed the worst face of the region's inequality, hitting lower income communities the hardest. Almost 5 million people in the region will slip into extreme poverty due to the pandemic. And climate change will add another 5 million by the year 2030. 
In this decisive decade, we will determine whether we can prevent climate change and make our communities safe, and if we can climate-proof our hard-earned developmental gains. Today's decisions will shape the climate scenario for decades. Latin America has an historic opportunity to recover from this crisis by addressing social inequities through a green and resilient economic recovery. We are not giving up the fight against climate change. This is our renewed commitment to fighting inequality and poverty, building a bridge towards a brighter, more prosperous and inclusive tomorrow. Okay. Okay, um, we are having a few connection issues potentially with our next guest, but um, let's, we'll try it anyway and see how that goes. Um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Marcelo Mena um, to, the, to our conversation. He is an environmentalist, a committed environmentalist, and the former Minister of the Environment uh, in Chile. Um, Mr. Um, Mr. Mena, thank you for joining us. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, I'm all right. Oh. I can hear you fine. Sounds good. There's no connection problems at all. <laughs> um, listen, your corner of the world is, uh, is certainly uh, a beautiful place and, and you've done um, a lot of work to, uh, to keep it that way. Um, I wonder though, climate change significantly impacts the Latin American and Caribbean states region. Um, and perhaps that's why your, your regions are, are recognized as leaders in, in a collaborative regional approach to, um, to accelerating climate adaptation. Um, have, are they leaders simply because they had no other choice but to become leaders? I think um, one of the things that we have, uh, that we, the Latin America has, is sometimes a lot of the, the support from the, the multilateral banks is not as, as harsh, so we make do with what's available. But in many ways, uh, we have been able to turn a lot of the threats into into uh, better uh, preparation and adaptation. We've been able to turn uh, the fact that we are, we, that we have the threats and, and we have to make plans to, uh, to, um, to confront these issues. And for example, look at Costa Rica. Costa Rica for, for many years was losing a lot of uh, their forest cover and they were becoming less resilient. They got rid of uh, subsidies for, for uh, livestock uh, production and now they have doubled their uh, forest cover and they are more location and since then they've started their forestry they're building and and, and they're sorry they're growing uh, bananas and cocoa and and coffee without cutting down forests and and so we've shown that nature-based solutions are possible to do things without having to destroy the environment i mean it's it's all very well to say you've you've been great at identifying threats, but I feel like what came out of what you just said was the daring step of what, the example that you gave in Costa Rica to actually um, you know get rid of subsidies. Does it is is that the kind of extra mile that um, uh, that governments are going to have to go in order to to really book some success? I think uh, overall the, the things that we have to do is we have to price risk correctly. And we have to incorporate risk into our social sector. And multiple countries in Latin America, including Mexico, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, are starting to work with the network of greeting the financial system, which is uh, trying to uh, incorporate climate-related risk into decision-making processes in the financial sector. Regulations that they use, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stock managers, etc., to disclose climate risk. I think that's one way to do it. We started doing carbon pricing. We have uh, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Costa Rica, um, and Chile all having a price on pollution. We think that we need to incorporate this in, into the decision making process. Otherwise, we're just uh, kidding ourselves. I'm not saying that we're doing, you know, we're doing enough. We're certainly not. That's what we're doing, that we need to do much more. We are an unequal continent that doesn't have a lot of social protection. The social protection has uh, shown its limitations, and that's why we couldn't keep people at home in the COVID crisis. And the call for this study that we've been putting together with the Center for Adaptation is that we need to do much more uh, to, to adapt and use this recovery as an opportunity to build uh, a more inclusive tomorrow. Okay. Yes, and which impact... Oh, sad, I'm oh, so sorry, I'm but I've just been told we haven't got uh, time to uh, continue to another question. <laughs> Mr. Now, Vicky's very upset. Yeah, yeah I'm Vicky's very, very upset. upset. <laughs> thank you for being with us. <laughs> Indeed, thank you for your contribution. I congratulate you all. I'll call the whole day. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, 
Okay, what's coming up next, Vicky? Yes, well, now it's time to find out what makes a Brazilian city. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's see what happened uh, earlier today during the Global Ma Mayors Forum on Climate Adaptation. Uh, and this event is uh, where mayors um, from all over the world uh, show their leadership um, in accelerating urban adaptation. Um, and so it all took place in the Dutch city of Rotterdam. Uh -huh. hmm. And um, um, recently the city decided to start with a major project, seven separate projects, green projects, including huge parks, to deliver the answer simultaneously on COVID-19 by providing new job opportunities, but also to create green spaces for water um, in the city. And we afford a, a budget of some 300 million euros to do that. If we work together, I believe we can prepare our cities for a warmer future and create healthy living spaces where people and bio biodiversity can thrive. Distinguished mayors, GCA stands ready to work with you on this critical agenda. Let us work together to make this world and this series of the world much, much better and sustainable. The debate is no longer a matter of the environment versus the economy. The environment is the economy. The environment shapes the strength of our political systems and the resilience of our societies. We must adapt, we must act, and we must accelerate. We haven't seen blue skies for many, many years. And in this pandemic, we adopted a large-scale social um, uh, restriction or social distancing. And what happened, and we reduced office uh, activities into 25%. And for many, many weeks, we experienced blue sky. Yeah. We all know that any global solution without cities' participation could not exist and cities must immediately take action. As an inspiring city uh, aiming to find global solutions uh, on the issues uh, on the Climate Adaptation Summit and C40's agenda, we desire to take a more active role and become a leader. We all need to adapt now because tomorrow will be too late. Great. To discuss resilient cities and the ways that local governments are, are uh, using to protect their millions of, of inhabitants um, uh, using climate adaptation, we have joining us in the studio two gentlemen. Uh, to my right, it's Rogier van den Berg, um, Director of Urban Development for the WRI Ross Centre um, for Sustainable Cities and Arnout uh, Molinar, the Chief Resilience Officer with the City of Rotterdam. Um, now, Rogier and Arnout uh, have been uh, driving forces, I think I can say that, behind uh, the initiative just launched at the Mayor's Forum, the Thousand Cities uh, uh, Adapt Now initiative. But before I ask you guys a question, I'd like to actually turn, first of all, to Vicky, to my co-host. Um, cities are, are the place, really, where the effects of, of climate change um, are, uh, are felt, as well as the adapt adaptation efforts, most directly. Um, and cities are only growing. Uh, as a youth representative, what role do you think that um, you can play um, in accelerating adaptation in, in cities? Well, I think it's, it can be very practical. So, like buying plants for on your balcony uh, to ensure that there is more green, which will ensure that uh, the level of temperature will uh, go down uh, in, the, in the, the hot summers. Mm -hmm. um, or just get out the tiles out of your garden and plant yep. some green in it. And I think that... Um, it can be in the little things, and for young people, uh, I think that's 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 a good message message to, uh, yeah, to give them, yeah. uh, because like grown people can invest in things, but young people. You have money too. Young people mm -hmm. have money too. You can. Of also course, but like. You, I know what you mean. Know you you, you want to spend it on other things, right? So yes. you can just think, okay, what is like doesn't cost that much, mm -hmm. but will have impact. Yes. And I think this is it. 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. And um, zooming specifically in on the Mayor's Forum, mm -hmm. um, for, for you and, and the gentleman here, were there things said that uh, made you particularly hopeful that will help your initiatives, Rogier? Yes, many, but I think for the Mayor's Forum, it is really Arna that uh, should uh, yeah. talk about it. I mean, he'd be <laughs> the driving force behind that. So sorry to take over moderation. Thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> no, that's, it's fine. We, 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 we uh, have, have a lot of things, uh, what we've done together this year and, 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 and uh, working on the Mayor's Forum as well. So the Mayor's Forum, I think what, what my, one of my takeaways is that um, nearly all mayors said, um, we are now in a pandemic crisis, but actually we were already in another crisis. Other, uh, but but um, uh, we, we we don't call it that way. But the climate uh, change is a crisis. Mm. And so um, and if we are trying to um, uh, invest now in um, recovery, we better do it now in the right way. And mm. and so invest in green recovery, in just re uh, um, recovery. And one of the examples in, in Rotterdam, and in this case in my own city, is that that we launched the big seven, seven, seven projects in the city, and that's including adaptation. And so um, I think that that's, well, in all cities, somehow there is a kind of development going on. And if you do not include adaptation uh, today, it's actually a lost day, actually. Mm. That's, that's, that's my, my, my opinion about this. Yeah. yeah. And was there anything s not said that you wish had been said in that mayor's forum? Um, well, actually, I, I'm, I'm quite uh, quite happy with uh, with the outcome, and especially that these cities are all willing, uh, of course, to invest in their own cities, but also to share their knowledge with other cities. And so there's a, there's a kind of a growing moral. Uh, feeling uh, to, that we now have to really accelerate and, 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 and instead of um, uh, inventing the wheel ourselves, we, we have to do it together. We have to join forces, not only the cities, but together with the, the partners that were, uh, well, I think, uh, key leading here today and uh, launching this uh, initiative, the, yeah. the adaptation program. And Rogier, Vicky mentioned a couple of ways, but what are the, what are the other ways, maybe more structural ways that uh, cities can really uh, become more resilient? Well, I think we have all seen in this kind of in this pandemic how actually how what the lack of kind of urban services is in cities. Mm -hmm. So we've seen that I mean the pandemic hit the the, the poor and the vulnerable the hardest, um, and that's simply because the, the 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 amount of services that you can benefit from that cities can offer you are not equally distributed in the city. So some have access and some have no access. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some have no access to housing no access to space for social distancing. So what we have learned that, that we really need to rethink how we shape and craft our cities together with its citizens. Um, I don't know where you live, but I mean, walking around the block before you find a nice and beautiful tree or park, mm. I mean, it's difficult mm. in many cities. So that really needs to change. And that's actually not rocket science. Mm. It means dedicating more space to public spaces, thinking about planting trees, developing parks, um, that's within our reach. I mean, and who's getting it right then? Who's getting it right? I Where think, should we move to? Well, I think. I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm very happy that Rotterdam and Mayor Abu Talib has been so supportive of us. So I think the supporting the the, the seven projects that uh, that are currently regreening uh, the city of Rotterdam with a kind of real investment in doing that, in making that happen in the coming years. I think that's an example of how mm -hmm. it should a political decision, allocated budget and key projects that can be executed and can be done and can be finalized in a few years. Yeah. Mm. Are there particularly ambitious like innovations that are out there that you would love to see more cities embracing, sort of the cutting edge? Um, well, I think there's innovation. a lot of innovations that we have talked a lot in, 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 in our event on, on urban water resilience and nature-based solutions. Mm. So this is not only about kind of greenwashing the city, it's really about the structural assets that um, that, that green infrastructure has on offer in order to provide more secure to, to make sure, for example, that cities don't flood, they can absorb water. And how you kind of embed that in cities, that, that, that the innovation, a lot of the innovations is, is in the coordination between different departments in the city. Yeah. So can you bring mm. green infrastructure in as part of coastal defense. Mm. So that means that you have to discuss infrastructure investments, infrastructure projects in the context of nature-based solutions and the other way around. And a good, in, a good, another good kind of example uh, and that, that I think today was mentioned in, in, in one of the sessions is, um, 
in, in Freetown, for example, in Sierra Leone, where there were a lot of landslides because of uh, rainfall and flooding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there the mayor they, is brave enough to say, let's plant a million trees. Mm -hmm. Let's regreen this city. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot relates to leadership, integration and coordination of departments. Mm -hmm. And then we can achieve a lot. Yeah. Okay, clear. Thank you very much. I'm so, so sorry we don't have enough time to, to continue our conversation, um, but it sounds as though we can be very optimistic. Just quickly, though, about the Thousand Cities, who's next up in, in terms of the Thousand Cities initiative? You mean regarding the cities? Yes. Uh, uh, well, um, um, to be honest, uh, these Thousand Cities have still still to be selected. Uh, well, sure. we are already I active in 100 cities. Yeah. In the coming few weeks already, we mm -hmm. are going to select, and we, in this case, then, is the Global Center on Adaptation, uh, at least six cities in, in Africa mm -hmm. to continue uh, and, and apply the city adaptation accelerator in this case. Great. Uh, but th these names are, are, are not, not there yet on the list, but that's, that will be announced in a few weeks. But okay. I, I just want to add a bit, if, if I have uh, yeah. 30 seconds. Do we have 30 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, because, I mean, we started this program because we have actual projects under it. So yeah. one of the deliverables is on urban water resilience, in which, which we started in, in Addis Ababa, which we just started in Kigali, and we are now working with South Africa to start this work on urban yeah. water resilience in two other cities. Um, and there are many more of the deliverables that are kind of packaged under this Thousand Cities Adapt Now program yeah. that we kick-start or already have started, um, so the, the coming year is, 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 is another year of action. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a busy year. Yes, so as always. Like. Thank you very much, Rogier. Thank you, Arnaud, uh, for joining us. Um, I'd like to now welcome uh, via video, we have a message from uh, Mr. Jose uh, Antonio Mead, who's a commissioner of the, the GCA, one of the 31 commissioners. Me welcome, Mr. Mead. Thank you. How are you? B very well conducted. You, you've given this, this seminar a lot of dynamism. No. We won't miss being present there. Thank you very much. Let's hope your internet connection isn't too dynamic <laughs> to, to spice things up. <laughs> okay. Um, Let, let's, let's hope we adapt it well <laughs> and that it's resilient. <laughs> Listen, we just heard uh, about the Thousand Cities uh, Adapt Now initiative. In your experience, uh, Mr. Mead, how can cities be the key accelerator of adaptation globally? I think cities is for, where most of the economic activity happens. It's where we have the greatest uh, <coughs> levels Excuse of productivity. Me. And in many cases, they explain a lot of the depletion of, of the resources amongst rural areas. And I think that, that COVID has shown us in a way where there are synchronicities in terms of answers that, that are net wins, a, a, a larger use of bicycles, for example, that at the same time reduce the level of contact and reduce the level of contamination. But, but in some cases, adaptive would be costly. And I think that this means that events such as this one, the, the work that the GCA does, is really key to, to identify the trade-offs, to mobilize the partners, to recognize that there is no long-run contradiction be between adaptation and economic growth, but to recognize as well that in the short run we are competing with different agendas, that we're competing with different objectives, and that we have to really go out there and explain how it is that cities can improve short, medium, and long term, what the sacrifices in the short term imply, and what we're going to get out of those sacrifices in terms of sustainability, adaptation, and just quality of life. Okay, clear. And listen, you mentioned it there, uh, and some examples. We're in the middle of this global pandemic. Um, our, our cities, our communities need to recover economically. Um, how do we make sure they... Um, that it's a resilient economic recovery. Well, can you hear me okay? Looks like you took out your headphones. Oh, can you hear me okay, Mr. Mead? No, looks like we've got some connection problems. Okay, that's a shame. Sorry, but thank I, you. I think I lost you. Ah, okay. Can you hear me? No, I'm afraid we've got to round up, Mr. Mead, but thank you very much for, you, for the contribution that you made. Um, uh, now it's time uh, to address the elephant in the room. A lot of the, uh, the, the themes and uh, challenges we've been talking about are quite simply not possible to find solutions for without finance. Um, so uh, we're going to discuss global finance, but before I do, here's a short video put together by uh, a Dutch company, um, Van Oort, uh, and it addresses the difficulty of developing a business case for a climate adaptation financing. 
Our climate is changing. We need to adapt for future generations. That's why we have C, Sustainable Earth Actions. Within this game-changing program, we have launched the Climate Adaptation Action Plan. A plan that features new perspectives for communities, cities and governments. With new insights about vulnerable areas, thanks to the Climate Risk Overview. An interactive tool with many different layers to see how the local sea level rise is affecting, for example, coastal erosion, biodiversity, and the number of people impacted by extreme weather and flood risks. The action plan is an eye-opener to climate adaptation solutions that focus on how marine ingenuity can help us to protect the coast, how nature can play a part in this, and how we, in turn, can help nature. Let's share and connect visions in the Knowledge Hub, an international network at the highest level where powers and knowledge accumulate and combine in areas such as oceanography and ecology, impact and even finance. Because we need to join forces as part of our ambition for this global agenda. We'd like to help you with your challenge by identifying the risks early and together to investigate them, share thoughts and come with solutions. There's no time to lose. It's time for climate adaptation action. Let's connect. In partnership with the Global Center on Adaptation. Now the CEO of the company that made that video is our first guest in this session and that is Peter van Oort. Welcome Mr. van Oort, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Excellent. Um, we'll have two other guests who will be joining us. The first, uh, the, the first of those two is Mr. Rémi Riou, um, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Agence Française de Développement. Um, we're having a few connection problems, so I'm not sure if he'll be able to join us, um, but let's hope so. And finally, Mr. Jamal Sagir, the Professor of Practice at the Institute for the Study of International Development at McGill University. Um, and he's also a board member of the GCA. Um, hopefully he'll join us shortly as well. Um, Mr. Van Oort, Peter. Um, Van Oort is a Dutch, uh, a family-owned uh, Dutch business um, with over 150 years of experience in, in pretty much large-scale infrastructure projects. Why did uh, you and your company feel it necessary to create a tool um, like the one that you've, uh, that you've created? Well, um, um, we celebrated our 150-year anniversary two years ago, um, and we had as a guest speaker um, Cristiana Figueres, and um, she made a plea, you know, for future generations, um, you know, to spend time, money, um, and energy in in a, in, an, uh, in a resilient world, and um, so we made a plea um, as a company to uh, contribute to climate adaptation. At first, I, I'm relieved because at first I thought you said Christina Aguilera and I thought, yeah, that's an interesting uh, appeal <laughs> from Christina Aguilera. But it certainly no, wasn't for, Christina Aguilera, for, was it? Okay, good. No, um, she, no, no, Figueres. <laughs> okay. She, um, was the lady, she was the lady who was instrumental in the Paris Agreement. Yes, yeah, it's that Christina. Yeah. Vicky, you had a question. Yes. Uh, and what are the benefits of investing in large-scale infrastructure projects that deliver climate resilience to areas at risk? Okay. Well, um, uh, most, most coastal protection uh, infrastructure projects, uh, they, they address um, numerous of challenges. Um, uh, but there are also numerous of benefits. Uh, social benefits, economical benefits, uh, environmental benefits. Um, and by providing solutions um, aimed at resilience, what we do actually, we'll, we will, first of all, we create security to people living, you know, in a safe area, protected from the sea or from rivers. Um, 
but we also um, work on uh, um, uh, nature to survive. Um, but very important, what we also do, we create space, space, you know, like land and space to thrive. And obviously land is extremely beneficial to people. Safe land is beneficial to people. Particular, you would, I would say, in coastal areas, uh, densely populated, like cities like Jakarta, you know, where it is so difficult um, along the coastline um, actually to live with all this risk of flooding. So uh, there is a huge benefit to society. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Mr. Sagir now. Um, Mr. Sagir, are you there? Great. Yes. Yeah, good to have you on board. Thank you very much. Um, Peter was just extolling the benefits of, uh, of the tool that they've created um, and the importance of uh, investing in uh, climate adaptive infrastructure. But the reality is we're now in the midst of a, of a global pandemic. Um, how can we make sure that, that we recover from this global pandemic and become more climate resilient as well? Uh, again, I many thanks for the question. Good evening, everybody. But first of all, let's start with a basic statement. The world has gone mad. We are witnessing one of the worst depressions since the 30s. We have zero interest rate, low return, growing economic inequality, climate change haunting us more, and COVID is added on the tip of that iceberg. The facts are, are very clear. The world needs to change the course of action. Now, coming back on the issue of what needs to be done, if you look at the funding right now that is coming to adaptation, before the crisis we had $30 billion in adaptation on average between 2017 and 2018. Now we expected that it will go a bit more because the needs are around $300 billion by 2030. But guess what? It's going down and we should be concerned. What's happening, the pandemic, differently, for health reason, normally, for social reason, most of the fiscal stimulus packages went for the pandemic. Actually, if we look at uh, what was done in terms of COVID recovery for uh, packages, we talk about 25, 22 billion trillion dollars that has been put so far. Only a fraction, less than a third of that is going for integrating climate financial risk. In other words, if we continue on that stream, we might finish with the pandemic crisis, but we'll have another crisis coming right away after that. We need to tackle the two crises together, in parallel, in a much more strategic way, especially for developing countries that need much more innovative financing. And the question would be what kind of instrument we are talking about. Exactly. Yes. The instrument we have right now are almost limited. We don't have enough of innovation coming in the sector. We need to start thinking much more of what MENA region is trying to do, for instance, debt swap to for uh, adaptation for climate change. And that's a kind of mechanism that was developed in the Caribbean. Or we need to think about liquidity support. We need to think about re re uh, reduce insurance premium. We need to talk about public-private partnership to address those climate risks, like my colleague before said. These are the questions that we need now, the international community, to look at it. But my main concern is that what's coming for adaptation from the private sector is very, very limited. Out of those 30 billion, only 500 million went there. So we need the private sector to take the lead because the public sector and the international financial institution alone cannot pay the price and cannot definitely fill the gap. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Sagir. Um, and I'm pleased to say Mr. Ryu is, uh, is now available. I'd like to bring him into the conversation. If he is indeed Hello. available. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good to see Hello. you. Hello, no, sorry. No, sorry. no, no apology necessary. Um, Mr. Ryu, um, uh, the Paris Agreement has, has placed um, uh, climate adaptation on, on an sort of equal footing with, um, uh, with mitigation, but the reality is that a lot of the financing still goes uh, towards mitigation. How, how do we change that? 
Um, thanks, thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks to the government of the Netherlands and thanks to the Green to the Global Center on Adaptation. Uh, yes, I was the chief uh, negotiator on finance at COP21, so I very clearly remember uh, the deal uh, at that time. And at uh, AFD, the French Development Agency, uh, we take this issue of uh, adaptation finance uh, very seriously. Uh, we decided to be 100% compatible with the Paris Agreement. We have significantly increased uh, our flows uh, since 2015, uh, more than 6 billion now, uh, as President Macron uh, said uh, today, and um, out of which uh, 2 billion are for adaptation. And we multiply by four uh, these numbers uh, since uh, COP21, uh, so it, it makes about 45% of our uh, climate finance that goes to um, adaptation. So not, not yet at uh, half uh, climate finance, but uh, we're very close uh, to it. Um, we started uh, uh, with agriculture uh, and the water sector, which is the most uh, evident uh, uh, sectors. And now we are mainstreaming it uh, uh, with uh, infrastructure, uh, credit lines, policy loans, even health and uh, education, of course, uh, more and more with the, with the private sector. So all uh, colleagues at AFD now are taking um, uh, factoring um, adaptation uh, um, in. Uh, and of course, we also um, are taking care of the other 15% uh, because we have to uh, avoid and seize financing projects that would bear uh, a high risk of, uh, of yeah. a maladaptation. And, and Mr. Uh, Liu, um, just briefly, because unfortunately we're running out of time, um, uh, I mean, moves by banks like yours to, to be 100% cl um, compliant with the Paris Agreement um, are, are very positive. And I, I think we heard as well from the African, African Development Bank uh, doing similar things. But these seem to be the exception rather than the rule. Why do banks... Why are banks so reluctant or, or so slow, let's say, to, to finance adaptation as much as mitigation? Well, the target was not so clearly set at uh, COP21. So that's where such a big summit uh, as the one today is so important to give uh, a stronger guidance. And I would say that there's a clear momentum in the world of public development banks. So I'm, I'm also heading uh, the uh, International Development Finance Club, 26 of us, KFW in Germany, China Development Bank, DBSA in South Africa, JICA in Japan, BNDS in Brazil, many others. Um, and we already multiply by four uh, adaptation finance to reach 20 billion uh, dollar right now. And we decided to go further last November with the Finance in Common Summit, where we gathered not only 26, but 450 public development banks. And we took quite a strong uh, commitment uh, behind the adaptation finance and committing to mainstream resilience and adaptation in our strategies and operations. And okay, so it sounds as though it sounds as though the so future is, is is brighter uh, indeed with more right. development yeah. banks. Okay, that's good. Well, it's nice to end on a pos positive note. Thank you very much, Mr. Ryu, for joining us. Thanks to you. Um, okay, we're going to move on now, Vicky, to our final segment, which is the competition. Yes. Competition results. <laughs> uh, the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, uh, um, or rather the, the Global Water Partnership. This is their competition. Um, uh, they ran a competition to highlight uh, who the people and organizations are um, who are implementing creative solutions in the water sector for their communities, for their countries, um, and doing very good things. Um, so uh, the idea was um, for the Climate Adaptation Summit to invite um, the top scoring, uh, specifically African entrants of these change maker awards, that's mm -hmm. what they're being called, uh, to showcase their initiatives. Um, and what's more, the public actually got to vote on the favorite of those three um, uh, 
initiative of those three initiatives um, and we have a winner of that as well so we have a people's choice award and we have uh, and the other two uh, shortlisted companies but first before we or not companies rather initiatives um, before we uh, hear uh, what those initiatives are and who's behind them um, first a message from professor amadou maiga um, who's chair of the west africa region of the global water partnership and he's going to tell us more about these change makers Africa's vulnerability to the devastating impacts of climate change and its constraint ability to adapt have been well documented and discussed. What is discussed less often is the innovation, determination, and the resourcefulness that lies inherent in our continent's people. This is why it is my pleasure to introduce these free water change makers from sub saharan Africa each have led positive change in the water sector in their respective regions and communities. Each have shifted mindsets pushing for action where previously there was inertia and built, built climate resilience in the process. These three change makers who will compete for the title of people's choice during today's proceedings participated in the Global Water Partnership Changemaker Awards. The awards which were launched during 2020, one of the most extraordinary years in recent history. So they celebrate the teams and organizations shaping water decisions that build climate resilience. The awards were convened by Global Water Partnership with the support of a multitude of value partners. These three water change makers represent creative initiatives which have pushed the boundary beyond business as usual because during extraordinary times, business cannot continue as usual. In summary, these stories demonstrate Africa's vast adaptive capacity which can be unlocked and harnessed once we commit to decisive, swift, and perhaps most importantly, collaborative actions. Wonderful. African solutions for African problems. Let's find out who the three finalists are. My name is Indy Denala, Project Manager for Strengthening Climate Resilience in the Kafir Sub Basin, implemented under the Ministry of National Development Planning of the Government of the Republic of Zambia. The project is piloted in the southern part of the country in three provinces, cutting across 11 districts. The initiative aims at improving livelihood of the rural farmers by providing alternative sources of income away from the business as usual kind of monocropping agriculture. In this case, water points are provided for the farmers using solar powered boreholes and they are able to engage into hot culture production and be able to also rear small ruminants and village chicken and even engage in fish farming. This initiative is the definite way to go for, for Africa and beyond. And lessons drawn from this initiative can be replicated in other African countries because pilot program for climate resilience is piloted not only in Zambia but other African countries. Thank you. Zutari is the number one engineering company in Africa. For over 88 years, we've been developing innovative, sustainable and award-winning solutions across the continent. 
One area where we are helping Africa adapt to climate change is in recognizing the importance of investing in ecological infrastructure. We've been involved in studies that have shown the significant water resource benefits of protecting catchments through the removal of invasive alien plants and are assisting the Greater Cape Town Water Fund in installing monitoring systems to quantify these benefits. We also provide engineering support to the Working for Wetlands program, which has not only resulted... Right. Well, we cut that last video short, but they didn't win anyway. The winner is the very first video um, from Zambia um, uh, from Miss Indy Dinala. So congratulations to all three entrants um, who are all really winners anyway. Um, uh, and I hope you guys at home enjoyed watching those videos as much as we did. Um, it's always good to see people coming up with great solutions. On that note, we're going to wrap up this uh, cast talk, which is the final one of the evening. Um, tomorrow, um, we have lots more coming up. Um, and uh, what about the side events? Vicky, are there still side events that people should... Uh yes, well, there are some side events in our cinema. Yeah. So there are a lot of videos about all of the sessions or topics on the sessions um, that are very interesting to watch. So, so I think people should forget YouTube this evening, forget yes, Netflix, yes. forget all the streaming services. Just binge services. the videos that are on the... Binge climate yes. adaptation. Yes. That's what we'll be doing. <laughs> Promise. <laughs> yes. And um, yeah, looking forward to tomorrow. I think I would like to see the locally led adaptation session mm -hmm. um, and what about you um, I'm just going to focus on the sessions uh, um, that we have um, which I I'm still I'm still going to prepare okay um, but, but infrastructure is one of the events that's maybe interesting to yep. watch for yes that's what we're gonna do okay <laughs> thank you very much everyone hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again tomorrow